Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 104. In this episode, I interview Jeremy Silva. He is the owner of Build a Soil, and he's actually been on the podcast once before, episode 51, where he talked all about building soils and adding organic inputs throughout the growth cycle. This time around, we get into a variety of different organic gardening related topics. He talks about seed sprouted teas, cover crops, mulch layers, pH, and so much more. I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free gardening information of all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Bovida is sponsoring this episode. I've been using the Bovida 58% and 62% humidity packs for six years now, and they do a fantastic job at ensuring my flowers are at the ideal moisture content. Their humidity packs help maintain a stable environment, protecting against trichome damage, terpene loss, overdrying, and mold. Check out their website at bovidainc.com. That's B O V E D A I N C.com. I'll also have a link in the YouTube description section of this episode. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this episode. Check out their Smart Grow system. It's a fully automated system with a smart app for control. Plug in your equipment to the iHub power strip and you can control your equipment, such as the lighting on off, light intensity, and a sunrise sunset feature. You can also control the ventilation system to help dial in your environment's conditions. Check out their website at mars-hydro.com and you can use the discount code MrGrowIt for a discount on any of their products. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Their clip-on oscillating fan is awesome. I've been using their 6-inch version, but they also have a 9-inch version. It's easy to clip on the side of my grow tent and has 10 different speeds, which makes it easy to control air circulation. They do have a non-oscillating version of this clip-on fan as well. It also connects to their Smart Controller 69, so you can control the fans and other AC Infinity equipment through their app from your smartphone. The discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Jeremy Silva. Once again, how are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me on. This is great. Glad to be back. Yeah, the last episode we did together, uh, episode number 51, for those of you who didn't catch that, currently has over 150,000 views. Uh, insane, just on YouTube alone. And then there's the podcast platforms, which has a whole bunch of other listens beyond that. But it was crazy. There's a lot of people in the comments with a lot of positive feedback. And uh, I don't know if you remembered, but at the end of the episode, I was told people to comment if they wanted a part two, and it just went crazy in the comments. So welcome back for part two. Good. That makes me happy. As soon as you said 150,000, I was super impressed. And I thought, wait a minute, he's got a big show. I wonder if that's nothing. <laughs> so that's, good. that's good to hear. That's a good number. No, it's really, really good. Today, we're going to get into a variety of organic gardening related topics. So just a quick list of things I want to get into. Uh, seed sparted teas. I want to get into cover crops, mulch layers, pH and living soil, which is a hot topic. And a handful of other things, which I won't spoil it for the viewers. Although if you're on YouTube... You can always click in the description section. There's the timestamps so you can skip through and see the different topics as we go along. But first, can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And first off, I love the rundown you just gave because those are really good topics. And I could see myself using this for our customers in the future. Um, so my name is Jeremy Silva, and I'm the founder of Build a Soil. And uh, it started about 10 years ago. So it's a pretty big year for us being 10 years in. And I... You know, I anticipated that it'd be something that I would love to do for the rest of my life. I just wasn't sure if I'd be given the opportunity. And while it's not always easy, it's my favorite thing to do. And it started off from the desire to build living soil from scratch. And living soil is the term that was used a lot back then, so it's still around. And from that, we started lab testing all sorts of different things that have brought me to the current place where I think I can share some pretty valuable information with all of you. Awesome. So short and sweet. I know a lot of folks tune into your YouTube channel. So you guys exploded over the past year and a half on that channel. I mean, geez, what are you at? 130, 140,000 subscribers now? I'd have to check today. Yeah, it's been going up and faster than I anticipated. Dean, who uh, does our editing, he's a wizard. 
And he told me, look it, I'm going to have more than your Instagram here in this amount of time. And I said, no, it's 10 years of Instagram posting. There's no way you're going to do that. And um, he did exactly what he said he was going to do. And it was a great relationship where he's good at editing and I talk a lot. It was easy to get content. So <laughs> um, really happy to be on YouTube and really appreciate all the support. Tons of videos and good information on that channel. And I'll definitely have a link to the channel down in the YouTube description section below so people can easily get to it. All right, let's start with the first topic, seed sprouted teas. So um, can you break down what are the benefits of doing seed sprouted teas and how do you create them and how often should they be done? So this is a good topic and I'd like to bridge it into two parts. And I'll mention up front, the first is about SST and its origin and why we use it. And I can keep it pretty succinct. But the second part is we've moved away from seed sprouted teas. They still are very valuable, but the goal was to get the peak enzymatic content as you learn about biology, the breakdown of organic matter is heavily enzyme dependent. And that's why you hear people that eat raw. They're like, you need the enzymes in the food. When you cook it, you destroy it. And the enzymes are really important to gut health. In soil health, it's similar. And so um, Clackamas Coot, Jim, um, which by the way, we're going to do, he just sent me like hundreds of his Pacalola 1, his famous genetic that he did a back cross on. And I'm I'm super excited about it, uh, but not the Pacolo, the one, sorry. Uh, we grew that one last time. That just happened. That's why I'm thinking about it. But as far as Jim goes, Clackamas Coot, um, he was a bread baker. He owned a tree nursery. He was part of many different um, forums where we provided information to organic growers. And he was just looked up as this legend and people really trusted his advice because he backed it with facts. And he started postulating that, hey, these seeds, they have the energy of life in there. They use enzymes to sprout, not nutrients. And so he got some seed and he sprouted it. And there's more to the story, but long story short, he ground it, uh, blend them up in water and he watered that to the plants. And the next day in the morning, he opened um, the grow and he was thinking, wow, why are all these plants? Why do they have such turgor? Why are they so happy right now? What's different? And so over many duplications, you would get that same experience every time. And one of the things that is interesting is when you are, are gardening, it's like a pet. And you know when your, your pet wags its tail and is happy and the treat you gave it was something of benefit. And ubiquitously across the board, anybody that uses a sprouted seed tea, they see these benefits. And I'll tell you how to do it. It's pretty simple. But the fundamental philosophy behind it is that when you sprout a seed, it's this enzymatic process that allows the creation of life and it's dormant in there. We'd like to unlock those enzymes and then before the plant uses them, we steal it, we give it to our plant. And um, it also crosses over where people that eat a vegetarian or not even that, just a healthy lifestyle, a lot of times we're looking at seeds as a higher source of nutrition and oftentimes they'll have sprouted seeds as the more available nutrition form because that pre-sprouting unlocks some of the difficult to access nutrients and allows the gut to digest it. Probably also because of some of the enzymes. And enzymes are weird. The most research on enzymes is for beer brewing because that's where enzymes are very important for converting starch and sugars and making alcohol. And it's a certain process to make the same duplicatable uh, result. So you can get, find lots of research on amylase enzyme. But there's not as much information out there on phosphatase and protease and all these other ones that exist in every one of those seeds. And that's because the beer brewers didn't require that. But in soil, every single seed, regardless of what you get, will have a variety of enzymes that are of benefit. Um, so you can use really any organic seed to sprout and to, to tap into this benefit. Um, the first time that Coot shared it with us on the forum, he said, go find good organic seed, any organic seed. And the cheapest that you could access tonight if you don't wanna go online and buy any seeds would be to go to the grocery store and buy organic popcorn seed because they have organic popcorn seed in bulk available. And then you can just sprout them in a sprouting cup, in a glass jar. You can Google how to sprout seeds. And that led to us selling the Easy Sprout. It's my favorite sprouting device. And we would use those and fill them full and then you blend that in water. And we've got a blog article about SST. You can Google build a soil SST recipe. It breaks down like the measurement of how many seeds and how much water, but we found none of that really matters. You just need to sprout a generous amount of seeds. Say, you know, a quarter cup of seeds can sprout into a whole bunch of seed. 
And if you take that by volume and water in a blender, you just want to get maybe a quarter full of a blender, the rest water, blend it, dump that into your bucket of water and feed it to your plants. And that's the simple explanation. You can certainly get weird about the recipe. And that's why I gave you the blog. Um, and after that, people went crazy with it and they try a variety of seeds. I've used our cover crop. That's got 12 different seeds in it. So that's some variety for making an SST. Um, we like the corn a lot. Out of all the seeds that we've tried, when we get heirloom corn, the water smells sweet. It's really white. It seems like it imparts a lot more enzymes than a typical sprouting. I don't have science to back that up. I just know that um, the first enzyme that they found, I think it was something in the ocean, but the first time they were able to duplicate it naturally instead of like from an animal was in corn and it's called zeatin. And so that's part of the history there. Um, but fast forward, we started learning well, that these beer brewers, they're not sprouting their seed every time. Now there are still malting houses that do that. They'll sprout the seed across the floor. They have an entire process and then they brew the beer. But typically what happens is that's a professional job. And then those seeds, as soon as they're sprouted, they dry them out. That actually preserves the enzymes and they're active and available. And I used to think that's not possible because these are alive, but we're basically releasing the enzyme and then putting it in stasis. Um, and that is just a malted seed. So then we went on a mission. Well, what can we buy malted seed? And of course they want to sell it to you, but they heat it. And they do that because if you roast the malted seed to a darker color, you get more flavor. And so beer brewers have many varieties of roasting levels that they're looking for. So we went with the lightest one, the least amount of heat, and that worked really well. Um, fast forward, Coot and I made the gnarly barley, and that is sprouted barley, sprouted lentils, and sprouted um, organic non-GMO corn. And so when you're taking these ancient grains like corn and the, the lentils and you're adding the barley, which is heavily available, a lot of enzyme research, they've already been sprouted and dried. So now what I do is I take that, grind it up fresh in a blender and just sprinkle it on the soil. And it takes out the step where I have to plan a day ahead to sprout the seed. If you'd like to sprout the seed, it's fine. And many of us still do that. But what we learned was sprouting seed at home, if you're trying to do this, you want the tail, the little white part of the seed that comes out in originally to be as short as possible, about to just explode out of the seed or barely have left. If you get a long tail like that, much of the enzymes have already started to be utilized by that growth. And so if you are gonna sprout some seeds, you want to arrest them as soon as you see that sprouting and uh, blend them up and use them. You could even dry them out for yourself. Some people will put them on low in the oven, you know, like just to dehydrate them and they'll make their own malted seed. From what we can tell, there's pretty good science at these sprouting labs, and so they are able to unlock a little bit better, more consistent percentage of enzymes than sprouting your own seeds. But certainly, they both, I mean, they both produce the same reaction. It's unbelievable. So that's the whole story. I wonder maybe if you have any questions or anything I left out that might be helpful. No, that's pretty interesting. I didn't know about that that second part there. I know people are still sprouting their own seeds, but having that option, the other way to get the enzymes is pretty interesting. It was pretty interesting that you uh, even used this 12 seed blend, the cover crop blend. Cover crop makes a lot of sense for use because it's diverse. And so when we first learned about sprouted seed teas, we learned that basically every seed would work and nature does like diversity. Um, the other thought is, well, cover crop is usually on farm soil and sometimes those seeds germinate and die and it's 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 a natural process it's a living seed meal at that point even if your cover crop doesn't grow and you let it sprout and then and then you just till it in immediately it's it's a seed meal that normally you paid money for like soybean meal but these are better seeds you've made them alive in the soil and then killed them and they're fertilizer so many benefits um even if the enzymes aren't perfect your sprouted seed tea is going to have some nutrition. So That makes sense. So getting into cover crops then, there's so many different things that can be used. I know in your 12 seed blend, you have flax, clover, lentils, vetch, a whole bunch of good things. Talk to us about cover crops, you know, the benefits, uh, when they should be used. I know there's some debate on whether you should grow cover crops along with the plant or if it should just be in between grows. So talk to us about that stuff. Yeah, this is really good. Um, and this is a deep one. So I encourage people to do their own research because there's lots of great information. And some of these organic trials that are done, they have methods for 40 years, they've tested organic growing trials, no-till trials, and many of the higher producing regenerative farms 
um, the mission is spread where these cover crop companies pop up because they're using cover crop. It's working so well, they can then sell seed to other farmers and they start to receive the benefits. And on farming, it's pretty clear. If you have bare soil, that's not how nature intends it. And that's the conventional farming style. When it comes to organic farming, one of the benefits of a cover crop when you first start doing research is there's multiples, but the basic sense is that cover crops are beneficial plants that have the ability to improve the soil quality. They do that through a number of different actions. One is they grow vigorously and they cover all of the soil and they attract beneficial insects. Um, but on top of that, the thing I think they're most famous for is that clover legumes, clover is in the legume family. Um, they actually take nitrogen out of the air and they have the ability to fix that nitrogen through its nodules on the root and a organic process and put it into the soil. And it, it does it through two methods. One is the cover crop can go can grow in soil that your normal crop may not be as good at growing in because the soil may be not improved yet. Cover crop will grow in there and it'll add organic matter. And as you till that cover crop in, it becomes what they call green manure. You are fertilizing the soil by putting freshly green grown plant that's full of carbon and it used the sun and it grew some of the nutrients from the soil and you kill it. And now what happens is you turn these minerals that were down deep, it's pulled up to the top and it's turned in organically. So now your next crop can benefit from all that fertility. And also the soil structure full of organic matter will hold water, it'll hold beneficial life, it'll hold microorganisms, worms, all of these things happen by utilizing cover crop. And in a dry climate like Colorado, cover crop fields, when done right, they'll be like a microclimate. It'll be moist underneath the cover crop. The morning dew's on there. So it's just, when you think about how nature works, it makes a ton of sense. Now, what isn't as natural is when people first started using cover crop indoors. And I think a lot of it took off because it's kind of romantic. It's this emotional feeling to see all these plants like a jungle growing around your main cash crop because it feels like you're actually farming or gardening in a real way instead of just bare soil with a plant. And when you consider that, it makes a lot of sense, but we were told for a long time, whether it's in your raised bed vegetable garden or whether it's indoors, that adding all these plants would be a problem. For one, they would say it's gonna steal all the nutrients from your main plant, or it's gonna attract pests or problems. I found most of these gardening worries are inexperienced gardeners having many problems and um, correlation does not always equal causation. A lot of times when you know a whole system, you're able to utilize the benefits. And indoors, some of the best crops I've ever grown were when I started using cover crop. And it's hard to forget that. And I think what I relate that to, besides the fixing nitrogen, all these things, which um, fixing nitrogen takes a while. It may not be as big of benefit indoors, but when the plant dies, it returns nitrogen to the soil that way, even if it wasn't fixed. Um, but it, it can happen, it does happen, especially when you're growing no-till and you have cover crop going forever. Um, but the benefit that I think I experienced is some of our earlier soil recipes, they weren't as balanced because we didn't do as much soil testing and we would just throw in according to the recipes we read about. And a lot of them were heavy on extra inputs because more is better, right? Um, and we learned that some of those excesses were actually problematic. Some of the amendments like kelp, if you doubled or tripled just because you wanted to, they brought maybe some sodium or if you added too much certain ingredients, maybe there's chloride or bicarbonate. And for the most part, all these recipes work, but if they get junked up and too many of the bad ones, it takes a while for the soil to leach it out and deal with it. And when you put cover crop in, all of a sudden, you don't have to be as perfect at watering because if you overwater, the cover crop drinks it. If you underwater, you're gonna know because you're gonna get wilt in both the cover crop as well as the main crop. So it's more about the overwatering, it helps fix that. But it also sent, seems to digest some of the problems in the soil and then release them through the cover crop, which is no longer like too salty or too problematic. So it would like buffer a soil that wasn't perfect and I'd get really healthy growth out of the plants. And for when you're living soil, I mean, that's what you want. You want a, a perfect leaf, not burnt tips. You're, you're trying to put in, put in the natural method to get the results. And so um, for what it's worth, the cover cropping made a huge difference. And the argument that you touched on, should we grow them with the plant or not? It's a big one and I think that it's about technique. And so if you are, let's say you're growing a big tomato plant and you know they take lots of energy and they, they grow really big. Well, if you grow cover crop and you grow it 12 inches tall 
and then you come spread it and you put a little tomato seed, good luck. The cover crop will absolutely devour it, take it over, won't even have a chance. But typically on a farm, that's not how it works. They would till that cover crop in, they would cover it with plastic or they would at least cover it for a week or two, that would all turn into fresh soil, then they'd go plant their crop. Um, but for us, what we see most often is what's called living mulch or more companion planting. It doesn't have to be cover crop, but cover crops seem to be affordable. They have a lot of the benefits we're looking for. You can also grow herbs and you can grow um, some, some quick growing food crops as companion plants. But what I encourage you to do is let's say that same tomato plant scenario, if you plant the tomato plant first, or if you have a transplant and then you put the cover crop in, the cover crop becomes secondary. It becomes shaded by the bigger leaves. It never really gets to take off and it's more now in a support role where it's barely trying to stay alive underneath everything you have going on. That to me is the living mulch technique. That's where you get the benefit of the moisture management, the beneficial, um, the predators get to live underneath there. And as you chop it and drop it, and you might add some other fertilizers at some point, organic ones, they combine. And the build a soil way is to use like a, a high carbon mulch, like a straw mulch. And the browns that are the straw and the greens that are the cover crop, when they're chopped and combined together, that's the foundation of how you make compost. The browns and greens decompose into black rich compost. And because we like worms in there and all the beneficials, it provides a home where normally that bare soil would be beat by the sun, dry, and, and of no beneficial use to all these organisms. So. Like I said, we could talk for days about just this, but in, in that quick conversation, I wanted to try and really give you as many directional signs to start to research as possible. That makes sense. Yeah, I've been using the white Dutch clover uh, yeah. for several years now, and I did just the way that you had mentioned, which is you, you grow the cover crop and actually adding in that mulch along with it. And that's been beneficial for me. Now, one of the things I learned, actually a couple of people on my podcast tell me that thrips feed off of clover which I thought was kind of interesting to hear. It's nothing that I have ever come across. Have you heard of that happening before or no? This is more the fear, I think, that comes out. Thrips feed on everything. Um, so if you go in a grow and you're planting fresh seed, you shouldn't have thrip in the seed and it shouldn't be an issue. So if there's thrip there, it's a blessing. Now it's on the clover. It's not on your cash crop. I mean, what's the problem? Um, it can also be an early identifier if you see something. Um, but thripper is some of the easiest to deal with. It's not really a concern for most people. Commercially, it can be more of a problem because they can't use spinosad and some other ingredients, um, which does make it slightly harder. But um, I tend to avoid a lot of those things and go for first world experience. And a lot of people use cover crops successfully. And there's some interesting cover crops that you can try and use. Most of those are for management purposes. So if a big commercial facility started using our 12 seed cover crop and they didn't tend to the mashing it down or chopping and dropping, or if there was a pocket that got really out of control, the vetch can start to vine. And while I like that, some people may not. So they might choose something like the white dutch that is no management, it stays small. It never gets overgrown and it grows fairly slow. So it's easy to deal with and it can tolerate some really cold temperatures, which is great for outdoor use um, for like a cover crop. But indoors, I like the diversity. I love the blanket that the white, white dutch makes but I'd love having the peas and the flowers from the vetch and the, uh, the lentils and all the different things happening. And when I research permaculture, they often indicate that getting up to about 12 different species of seeds gives you the diversity that's required to have as much success on an open field from season to season where different seeds and different things can happen, right? Um, indoor, maybe not, as, maybe not as important, but I like that a lot. Other things you know, to consider, let's say you have cover crop going, um, a lot of this that we learned, I think that if I can point a direction that would be philosophical for a lot of your viewers, really changed my life, helped me start Build a Soil. A lot of people reference this book as one of the reasons why they decided to go no-till. It's The One Straw Revolution by Masanobo Fukuoka. And it's a story about somebody who worked um, in the, long story short, in the chemical field his whole life, chemistry, and then decided to go back to nature on his property, basically did nothing to it and observed and would see how nature works. And then when growing his crops, instead of growing rice the traditional way, flooded in water and transplanted by hand, they would throw the rice in the grain that was growing previously. And I think it was barley. I'm gonna get some of the um, exact uh, crops off, but they would spread it while the crop was still growing and it would germinate. And then they'd go harvest the next crop and that would grow up through it. 
And so you started to see some of the benefits of these natural cycles. And it teaches a lot about the no-till way and the philosophy behind it in that book. And it, it's, it's amazing. But he would teach people in there, you put all the crop that you, you chop down on the ground. And then he would go to the neighboring farms and they would have them all the, like, the stalks lined up perfect. He's like, no, throw it like a child. Like nature doesn't line it up. You're going to block all of the water and the light and the bugs and it needs to just be thrown out there. And so with that philosophy, he would say, return all of what you took to the soil other than the harvest. Um, and so a lot of indoor growers, they do that. They take all of the leaf from the plant, all of the cover crop that they chop, and they throw it all in the mulch layer on the soil. And while that's great, if you don't tend to the environmental rules and there's not enough airflow, you can create a lot of humidity, tons of decay, and you can start to get some of these bulb mites and you can get a lot of uh, beneficials, but they start composting right there. And if you're not judicious with you know, keeping it somewhat knocked down and airflow there, they'll start to climb up your main plants. And that can be a problem because beneficial or not, you don't want them on your plants. So that's one thing to learn is that whether it's good or bad when it comes to nature, um, there is some balance that's required. So if you're going to chop and drop, just know that you should have some decent airflow underneath there so that you don't build up this, you know, just massive amount of decaying matter. So... Let's get deeper into mulch layers. I know on your website, you sell the barley straw. I actually purchased some of that a while back. I use it in all my grows. But some people use wood chips. Uh, I, I know you don't have those on your on your site. Maybe talk about the, the reason why. And then also, can you get into the blue oyster mushroom straw log, the living mulch that you have on your site? Yeah, I'll talk about all of them. Because whether you buy it from Build-A-Soil, whether you're some part of the world where you can't access Build-A-Soil, I want you to be able to tap into this. And so the idea with straw is a fewfold. Um, we'll be carrying like an organic wheat straw that we use in the um, blue oyster straw logs. And we're shifting away from the barley, mainly because any mulch works. So I don't want you to have to go look for something specific. I want to put that out there. But I'll tell you where the barley comes from in case you're wondering why we used to be so specific. It used to be that if you had a pond on your farm or on your property and you wanted to eliminate algae, you would float a raft. And the way you do it is take some logs and you would tie a bale of barley straw to it and you just float it out there. And the breakdown would cause an enzyme release that would kill all of the algae and make the pond healthy. And so we thought, wow, if we're going to really risk chopping up straw in our grow, maybe one that adds some benefit would be of use. But really, it doesn't matter. Any straw. And here's the next thing. Um, be careful. Like if you just go down the street or Craigslist and buy weed free straw, that's typically Roundup sprayed. That's why, that's why it's in the weeds. Um, so we really just want something that's like seeds are fine, right? You just, that's more cover crop. Um, especially in a container grow, you can always just pull the seeds. If you mulch thick and some seeds start to sprout, you can just take the whole layer of mulch and flip it. And now they're extinguished. At least, you know, on an outdoor farm, you can just use your pitchfork and flip them. Um, but the mulch, so the straw mulch, the idea was is that we're covering the soil, keeping it moist underneath it, blocking the light, allowing the worms to come up to it and pull whatever top dressing down and be happy. And it works great. Um, the straw that we sell is more affordable, but it can be dry. And so one of my preferences for somebody that's doing it um, by hand is to put it in a bucket and pre-moisten it a little bit. Then when you place it, it's really clean. There's no dust. It's easy to do without making a huge mess. Um, but oftentimes those are big chunks and I would like chop it up so that, like around, around the edges of my container to make it fit in there. Um, and then the blue oyster straw log, it's, that's already all done. And that's part of the benefit. Um, I'll, I'll get in deeper because it'll take a second to explain so people can follow me. But let me just go through the wood mulch first and then I'll revisit. So wood mulch, we used to carry... There was a local compost yard. I used to work with him when I first started build a soil. Um, and he had a screening machine. So he would take his compost that took a year or two to make and he would screen it. And all of the reject wood chips that would kick out because they're slightly too large for the screen, they were full of mycelium and they're beautiful. And so we would actually sell that as our composted wooden bark mulch. And people loved it. But even when I used it, I would notice that that much woody carbon, it didn't seem to break down into soil nutrients as fast. For a living soil um, but it attracted a lot of the roly polies and those little guys although they seem great and they are a benefit 
if you get bark mulch and you get a proliferation of them, which they often come in the bark, you can have a million of them. And they literally, once they run out of stuff to do or overpopulate, they will start climbing your plant. They will start stripping the stalks, eating leaves, eating seedlings. And this is what I talk about with nature. There's two sides to it. And oftentimes when you hear something from fear, like, oh, thrip or on clover, you only get the one side. And nature is never that way. And so there's a great benefit to the wood mulch. But I'm trying to tell you the other side that these beneficial insects that are of benefit, if a population outpaces any predator, I mean, it's almost like you need like to put some little birds in there and eat them all or something. Like it gets bad. Um, it's not good. Now, I w- I'm happy to report it's pretty rare that you get an overtaking of the roly polies. But that's part of the reason why I don't recommend wood a lot. Um, the other reason is people ask a lot of questions and they used to be like, well, is this wood allelopathic and does it have chemicals that kill the other tree that grows near it? Will that ruin my soil? You can't use cedar. What if I... Basically, from what I've learned, anything works as mulch. But if you start mixing it in the soil, now you, you should be asking questions about what type of bark it is. So um, hopefully that helps or what type of wood chip it is. Other thoughts. Um, wood chips are used for a different purpose than we use them for. So when you look up regenerative farming, a lot of times you'll you'll have conversations about wood chips. And the best, I believe, are the rainial wood chips, which are very young trees. And when they're cleared out, you have very fresh more easily absorbable carbon that's not so lignin, that's not so hard to decompose. And you put it through a, a chipper and you don't have to take the whole tree, just some branches, right? So you're not killing a tree. But they would spread that on the property on soil that they were planning on using in a year or two. And that would enrich the life and the fungus and add organic matter and really improve the soil. But during that first year, you can't really grow in it. The wood is so high carbon, all the microorganisms eat first and you take all the nitrogen out, the plants can't really grow. Um, another place you hear this is the Hugel culture beds. If you've not heard of it, Google H U G E L Hugel culture. And it's a method of digging a hole, bearing old rotting wood and then building a mound on top and growing that way. But the first year that wood does tend to rob some nutrients. Um, so that's a thought, but when stuff's on top, it doesn't really rob nutrients, whether it's straw or mulch. So don't worry about that when you're looking into mulching, as long as it's on top. That's just a, like a skin layer. It just protects the organism of the soil. Um, now that was a lot, but I really want to talk about the blue oyster straw log because it's a pretty simple connection. The straw that we would use, it's great, but you'd have some weed seeds growing in it sometimes. It's fine. You just pluck them. Um, also, it was a little dry. And so we had a local mushroom farm that said, hey, I've got straw. Maybe you could use it. Um, and they wanted us to talk about making compost from all their waste. Well, I'm not going to drive down there. I didn't have the equipment. It wasn't, it wasn't conducive to me you know, making the compost for them or them doing it for us. But we decided to sell, when they were done growing blue oyster mushrooms, they could get another fruiting out of them. But economically, once you've done one or two cycles, you don't get as much result on the third, fourth cycle. So they would just discard these bags that had straw in it. And the benefit there was the straw had already been um, sterilized. It had already been heated in water and made to receive the mushroom mycelium. And they put these grain in there that have all of the, the blue oyster mushrooms they were growing for natural grocers, all organic. And it was inside there and they'd already grown the mushrooms and we would just buy them used. And so a customer would cut it open, put it on their soil, and sometimes another mushroom would grow. And it was all moist and it was already sterilized. So you felt like you're not introducing any pathogens. Um, but a couple things would happen. One, they would turn green from trichoderma. It's of benefit, but it would scare some people. And then the second thing that really put the icing on the cake is they went out of business. <laughs> so I couldn't get them anymore. Um, luckily, Man Purse Medicinals, aka Kevin, he works here. Um, he's a mycologist and went to school for science, worked at a, at, like in a white lab coat in a lab for a long time. I mean, he has a whole background. And since his passion was mycology, has a flow hood, the whole deal, he ran with it. And he immediately started making blue oyster straw logs. But instead of growing mushrooms first, we offer them to you just like the mushroom farm would grow. And they are ready to fruit. You can grow mushrooms and eat all of them and harvest pounds off of them and then convert that to mulch. Or if you don't want to grow the mushrooms, the cost is so good, you can just cut it and put it as mulch. And the main thing here is now it's wet, now it's sterilized, and now it's really clean mulch. It's slightly chopped up smaller to make sure the mushrooms grow on it properly. And so when you use it, you you get this like mushroom rich odor when you spread it. And here's one of the caveat, one of the benefits. When we look at what it's made out of, so most of the earth is cellulose. That's one of the most abundant materials out there. So you think cellulose is plant material. 
you know, organic stru- cell structure. But the next one that's most ubiquitous is chitin. And chitin, we know, activates some plant defenses because chitin is what insects are made of. Well, it turns out mushrooms are made of chitin. So when we get this blue oyster straw log that's inoculated with all this fungus and it's all white and fully grown and you spread it out, you're inoculating your soil with chitin-rich material, which will allow those building blocks to occur to build the fungus that you'd like, as well as maybe activating some of that SAR or response from the plant um, that we're after. Now, I don't want to say it does it. I just want to say if there's even a hypo- thought, if there's just even a hypothetical benefit, it's worth research. And so um, the chitin is its an interesting one. It's spelled C-H-I-T-I-N. And we used to call it chitin because we never heard somebody say it out loud. It's like, you got to be chitin me, you know? And no, it turns out chitin, not chitin. So That's pretty cool. I'm going to have to pick up one of those mushroom straw logs and try that out for myself. That sounds pretty cool. It is. And it's one of those that's great because Kevin gets to add the value. A lot of people use them for mushrooms, get more than their money's worth out of mushrooms before they use it as mulch if they have the discipline. But it's fairly hard to reproduce on your own. You got to like sterilize, boil water, get the grain. and inject- So he really is adding a lot of value by making it. And I think that's a true win-win, you know, so. Absolutely. I do have another mulch question. Well, it kind of relates to mulch, not necessarily is mulch, but a lot of folks in order to retain water and stuff, and you guys do it with the earth boxes, is just simply cover the top of the yes, soil and you use a, a piece of plastic so that um or some people using cardboard as well they're cutting up pieces and then putting it there but it's not actually like breaking down like a mulch i guess that's why you know i want to know if we really want to consider it a true mulch but it's not really breaking down what are your thoughts on like ca- putting cardboard on top i think there's a benefit we did it in one of our last youtube series not to live as the mulch but when i left town i actually covered the recently decomposed cover crop with the cardboard to keep the light off of it and let the organisms work it into soil. When I pulled the, the cardboard off, you could, I mean, the cover crop was gone. It was all soil. There was a couple little patches, but you'd work your hands in and it was no longer six inches of plant. It was soil. And so that cover is one of the benefits of mulch. If you're using, um, you know, a carbon rich mulch or uh, a green manure mulch where you're chopping the greens and mulching with it, those all have multiple benefits, but with multiple benefits comes some responsibility. Like I said, it's adding nutrients, it's decomposing. And so a simple cover removes all of the thought of how long does it take to decompose and is this good for my soil? And it simply covers it. And cover is good because the soil doesn't need to be hit by the UV of the sun and your, your lights. And then the worms can come right up to the soil surface and there's a whole population of beneficials. You can peel the plastic back and see it. And I originally didn't like the idea of the plastic because it's not as romantic as I say. It's not as like, it doesn't tug on your heartstrings. It, nature's not always that way. A lot of us think nature and just have all these views, but it's like nature can be pretty hardcore. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of like, besides poison ivy and animals killing each other. I mean, it's not always all perfect. But when we're looking at covering it versus the natural process, at least you get that cover. And when it comes to organic farming, they use plastic a lot. Now they get a really thick piece that they can reuse over and over so they're not being wasteful. But when it comes to commercial farming, like if you picture a hundred foot row, three feet wide, full of lettuce, or, or they're about to seed it and they have to use machines to seed it so it's all evenly done, you can't just cover crop and then run the seed machine. So what they would do is they would cover crop and as soon as it got a few inches tall, They would use a machine to kind of just lightly till it under or whip it under the first layer so now it's buried by the soil and then come pull that heavy black plastic over and put rocks on it, wait a couple of weeks, pull it all back off and have unbelievable carbon rich, black, beautiful soil that has been freshly inoculated with all that that mulch and then they plant into it. So using a cover is understanding how to use a tool. And, And the earth box, the reason why we recommend that cover is we have a lot of our customers that use straw and cover crop in the earth box, and it works great. But the earth box is only about a cubic foot of soil, maybe a cubic foot and a half, plus the, the water holding area. When you grow a big plant out of that, it can start to run out of nutrients. And if you have a regular mulch layer, you can only water through it. But with the plastic, you can mound, picture this is the container, the earth box wall, and your plant is in it. You can mound three, four, five, six inches above the top with compost and organic amendments. And the reason why this works is you don't have to water on the top where the water spills out the side. You water down below in the earth box. And when you cover that big mulch layer that's packed as a mound with the plastic, the feeder roots can go all the way up in it and digest it. And in the earth box, 
normally that much mulch material might be a little rich, but the earth box has clean water. So the roots can always access water without nutrients to balance. And it, it seems to work really well. So I like the cover. I just don't like its appearance as much. And I really do like fresh straw with the green cover crop. It really is something like art. I just, it's beautiful. So yeah, I've been using the cardboard to cover on uh, some of my recent grows. Just I did have somebody comment on one of my videos mentioning that there's some concern that chemicals are kind of that are on the actual cardboard could get released into the soil and those chemicals don't break down very well. And same thing with like the plastic. Have you heard anything about that? Is that actually a concern or what? I would say it's not a concern, but I want to, I want to get there because their thoughts are totally in the right place. And you should be concerned because most of the industrial stuff is going to have some problems with it. But I would encourage you to think of it as a lot of these compounds the plant's not going to take up. Like some people are worried about some of the chemicals in plastic. I'm like, I mean, farmers use PVC all day long to irrigate and none of that actual material grows into the plant. But we don't want to hurt the soil either. And we want to be mindful. But I think if you go narrow focused on something, you can kind of get a little too deep without missing the rest of the opportunity. Composting by nature cleans it removes pathogens and chemicals and it improves so that if i was really going to be forced to use something that was contaminated composting it and then working it through worms would give me the most relief that at least we tried to remediate and so when you're talking cardboard that's mostly carbon oftentimes it's either newspaper to a worm bin or cardboard to a worm bin now as a cover it's different but in a worm bin people shred cardboard shred newspaper they feed it to their worms the worms don't die the worms go crazy they eat it all but the, the thought is the ink on the newspaper is a problem. And they're like, it's chemicals. Well, it's soy-based ink and it's not really a problem. The challenge I have is I don't try and put Roundup sprayed soy that's industrial in, in my grow. So I would try to avoid it. But the smarter side of me knows that it's small amounts and the microorganisms and the worms just rip that to shreds as far as the actual chemicals. And what I mean is if a chemical's in there, composting, biology, worms, and their enzymes, they can actually take a chemical structure and break it apart so that it's no longer that dangerous chemical. It's just the carbon, hydrogen. It's just the individual components that made something like that, its structure. Um, and I, I won't say that you know you can take something like a radioactive waste and it'll be clean just because you have some worms in there. But my suspicion is a small amount of cardboard, when you see the worms going into grooves and mating and the enzymes that are being produced... I find it very, very, very unlikely that you'd have any sort of health um, problem from doing that, whether it's soil or your own health. And so I'm not a doctor, but I really think that you'd be fine with some cardboard on top of your soil. Uh, but I also understand what they're saying, right? Some of these, maybe the glue has got something in it that's a little bit weird. Um, and so those are my thoughts on it. Understood. All right, let's move on to a viewer question. So this one was actually left in the comments section on the last episode we did together, and it relates to pH in living soil. So this viewer says their tap water comes in at 8.9 pH, and after filtering, it still 8.5 pH. Should they lower the pH of the water prior to doing a soil drench? If so, what should they use to lower the pH? It's a good question. Um, pH in living soil has always been a big uh, like argument point. And I'll give you a little spiel on soil pH before we get into what this person should do about their water. Um, because there's no one simple answer. I kind of relate it to jujitsu because I, I grapple regularly. And when you get an answer from a white or blue belt, it might be an answer that would work, but you don't know if it works up to the highest level. And you start to find when you ask a black belt, hey, how do I get out of this problem? And then he just looks at you and says, don't, don't get in that problem. <laughs> you know. And so it's kind of frustrating. But typically, the smarter people I know, they don't have just a straight answer. It's kind of like it depends. Um, so when we're talking about pH, it really does depend. Um, when you're on a farm and you're growing out here in Colorado, our soil is pretty alkaline. But if it's not full of alkalinity and problematic substances, it's just full of calcium, it's amazing soil. You don't really want to lower the pH. And what I mean by that is the soil is made up of these elements that dictate the pH. Same in our potting soils. So when we make a potting soil it's, and we're adding copious amounts of rock dust, clays, and composts, we're attempting to mimic a regular high organic matter soil. And so that's why we call it living soil, not potting soil. Potting soil is basically hydroponic. It's just a medium to hold water. But 
When we get to the point where we're designing it and we send it to the lab, you can see this percentage of calcium, magnesium, potassium, all the different things that are in it. That's actually what creates your soil pH. And so if you take some water and you put a half gallon in there and it doesn't just pour out the bottom, like you're not leaching the soil, you're just watering it. The water isn't going to change the pH of the soil unless you strip out the calcium or add more magnesium or dump sodium in it. That's what dictates the pH of the soil. And a lot of growers, they start reading, they're like, wow, plants can't take up nutrients if the pH is off. That must be what's going on. Well, they also can't if you're overwatered. So sometimes it's something else that's, that's causing the issue, not really the water. But um, when you, let's say you took perfectly clean water and it was 7.0 pH, it was just RO'd, there's zero parts per million in there. And, you, and someone tells you 5.5 pH is better, so you pH down. I mean, literally you're putting a little bit of, you're just adjusting the hydrogen ever so slightly. There's no sodium in there, there's no calcium, there's nothing that's really gonna change anything. The soil will probably change the water. But what's interesting is the soil pH is what dictates the uptake of nutrients, and the root in a living soil grow can change the pH in that two to three millimeters zone uh, right around the root tip significantly. And on, on an exponential scale, moving a point or two is like logarithmic. It's like much greater than it sounds. And the plant can do that. So who are we fooling if we're trying to predict the perfect pH where the plant might be saying, no, I'm trying to force the soil to be in this range and you keep coming in and changing it. So being a steward means trusting the soil, but you can't trust some soil that's full of salt. I'm saying a well-built soil, the pH should totally handle itself. And you, you just should not have any concern of pH at all. But here's the curveball. When you're farming out here on this alkaline soil and you water with ditch water that is run off from all the other farms by the time it gets to you and it's high in alkalinity, not just pH. And I know they sound the same, but you can do more research on water and I'm certainly not an expert. I just know enough to be dangerous. That alkalinity is actually the problem, not the pH. It's that it's bicarbonate that's in there and chlorides that's in there and maybe some magnesium sodium that's just jacking the pH. And so you go water with it and it's not like the high pH water is the problem. It's the fact that we are already fairly alkaline and the biology and your cover crop finally released some calcium from the calcium carbonate and the plant root is about to access readily available calcium and the water that comes in is full of carbonate, bam, binds up in a calcium carbonate the plant can't get it anymore. So when the biology is trying to do all this work and our water stops it and binds and makes other chemicals and is constantly causing issues, pH is a concern. And what's interesting is that acidifying an alkaline soil actually eliminates those carbonates that are the problem, not really the pH. And so now the calcium stays available. And so I find it fascinating that there's so much to learn about water. And I will say, none of it matters when you're on regular water. It's when you have well water, ditch water, things that may have stuff in it that really messes with your soil and can build up over time. It'd be very worthwhile to go to Logan Labs out of Ohio, go to loganlabs.com, and go to their water analysis, print out a report, call them, whatever you gotta do, and then you put the water in a bottle, you mail it to them, and they give you an analysis. And they'll tell you, here's everything. And even if you don't know about a water test, you can just take the recommended numbers and compare and see where you're high or low and then make some guesses and then maybe do some research. But um, what's interesting about the, the person that you're saying asked the question is they're on tap water. It's, it's fairly rare to see such high pH out of the tap because most municipalities have rules for what will ruin the pipes and what's good for humans. And so I wonder if that tap is connected to a well, and that's why he's, it's, it's really well water, but it's his tap water, in which case you'd have to do a water test. Because if that's just some minerals that are you know non-problematic, it could be that he just waters with it, it's fine. Um, it used to be that the living soil growers would use Ag Sil 16H, like every watering, even though it's not organic, but it's made from sand, so none of us really cared. Um, but that's like 11 pH, and when you check your water after adding it, it's like nine, and people would water every time, and they'd be like, this pH doesn't matter. Um, and I think partially the, the mulch layer and a volume of soil, it can definitely fix a lot of those issues. But in a smaller container with nine pH, if it's full of a problem, it'll, it'll be realized fairly quickly. A big bed of soil might buffer it, so it's a non-issue. Um, you can reverse osmosis that, and a lot of people say, don't use RO. I agree because it's wasteful. It takes part of the water and discards it and it's slow and it's you know fairly expensive, but it does fix the water. And in living soil, you don't like it'll work just fine. RO is not gonna hurt anything. It's just more like maybe not the best way to do it. 
Um, so that's an answer. Without a soil test, you could just RO it. And you know, if it's sodium in there, you're not going to filter it. You'll have to RO it. And then the sodium's gone and your plants are going to grow like crazy. Um, in the meantime, if you're really worried, you can just go buy some water and use that until you get your water tested. It's kind of a pain to lug water around, but at least you know. And if this was just tap water and it was 8 pH or something, I would just use it and, and see. Um, you could always buy water, use it on some plants and use your tap water on one and kind of decide going forward. Um, but I, I guess the gist of this is it depends, right? Um, there's no one right answer for you. And so um, I will say pH should not matter. But when you have water that you know is problematic, it returns to the equation and it's important to have good water. So. Do you recommend checking the soil pH with like either the, one of those blue lab probes that go right into the medium or doing a runoff pH test when growing with organic inputs? No. Um, I mean, it depends, right? If you know nothing and you don't know where the soil is from and you're just trying to figure out a baseline, maybe getting a lot of measurements on it would be good. Um, but for instance, I might have a high pH just from having lots of calcium in there and the, the soil not really being used and wet. You probe it and you're freshly potting up and it reads a little high and you start tinkering with adjusting the pH and you mess something up. Where a lot of times, um, you know, you send it to the lab and it might be slightly high pH, but you know, a lot of our crops like a higher pH above neutral and it's fine. And so we shouldn't freak out. Living soil, like I mentioned, the root tip and everything has a way to, to buffer. And so that enables us to take advantage of the buffering qualities of the soil. Like in hydro, if you're not exactly in the pH, the nutrient won't go into the plant. But in soil, we have a lot of buffer room. Um, and so I think that that does change things a lot. So how about EC or P some people do PPM? Would you monitor that or recommend people monitor that when they're growing with organic inputs? No, I mean, some outdoor growers, some growers do when they're making a lot of um, teas and solutions. And I won't, I, I'm not going to say that you're trying to target some PPM, um, some EC level, but it gives you some indication. Like if you are a grower and you just fly to someone else's farm for the first time and you've used these tools, you could go, oh, the water's pretty clean. It doesn't have a lot in it. I have my meters. It tells me what's going on. And you might be able to get up to speed faster. But um, probing the soil pH, like I said, may not really tell you as much in the sense that a lot of people would test their runoff. And I'm like, well, the runoff may have nothing to do with what the soil. So we'd recommend a slurry test. And I know those pH meters work, but um, I kind of lost track when I was talking the last time. But when it comes to the pH, if you send your soil to a lab and they tell you why, sometimes there's just a little bit too, too much magnesium in there and it jacks your pH. But, but it can be dealt with. And so just getting the pH reading on its own, although it might be valuable, it doesn't really tell you how to fix anything. And so now you're just going, well, do I pH down my water? Not if it's sodium in your soil that's causing the high pH. And sodium and magnesium can just jack your pH really high. Um, and so what we typically recommend is if you're seeing a high pH in a soil and you've tested and now you're convinced that there's a problem, you can use a tablespoon of gypsum in a four or five gallon bucket of water and you can leach that through the soil to there's good amount of runoff. And the sulfur that's in the gypsum will rip the excesses out of the soil and flush them out and replace them with calcium. And a high pH soil that's high calcium crushes. A high pH soil that's got magnesium and sodium and potassium, just terrible. So it's not always the pH and that's why I recommend sending it to a lab so we can see what built that pH. What does it consist of? Um, but the EC and the PPM meters, I know some people that they're like, wow, this recipe I make with the compost tea, it works so well every time. They'll get a reading and maybe next time they do it, they'll see if the reading is the same and they'll start to share that as kind of a baseline. But right away, you can see some crazy readings in some of these organic solutions and it doesn't really mean that it's plant available. And so, um, in my daily life, I don't use a pH, EC, any of that pretty much ever. So. Yeah, I've been pretty hands off ever since I've been using organic inputs. Is I haven't really needed to check the PPM or the pH at all, really. I mean, there's people that test the pH of their saliva and of their urine, and they try and eat foods that are more alkaline causing to put themselves in a healthy condition. I'd say 99% of those stop doing it after a few days and just eat healthy and decide this whole thing's bullshit. Good <laughs> food is good food. Like, why do I need to control all of it? You know? <laughs> I think that's when we're looking for a shortcut. Like, is there one food that'll fix all of the problems that I have? It's like, no, alkaline food or healthy foods. Just throw the chart away and eat healthy.
<laughs> right. <laughs> Let's move on to another topic here. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on sugars. So a lot of people are adding in molasses, for example. Uh, some people use honey or brown sugar. What's your overall opinion on adding sugars in throughout the growth cycle? You know, um, this is one I'm not an expert on. And I have my opinion, and I'll share it with you. And it's based on, you know, the last 10 years of build a soil and previous to that, just growing for myself. And um, I think a lot of it was hydroponics grow stores selling sweeteners that made sense because you're like, I want oozing sweet resin and I want flavor. And so it just makes sense. The human mind's like, oh, yeah, that'd be good. I mean, you'd hear of people adding Kool Aid to their water to get more grape flavor out of it. You know, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> I, I, there's just so much out there. Um, and a lot of it comes from the best intention as far as our, our thought process, like even flushing. I get flushing the medium, but you're not going to go pull a non-mobile nutrient that's in an elemental form that it's not, it's plant, and pull it out like a straw. And so um, there's lots of considerations there, but um, yeah, I just, I have a hard time thinking that certain sugars are going to make a difference. So let me bring it all back around. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, there's all these different percentages and different ingredients that you might add. Coconut water is one of my favorites. It's got a good number of all of those. But the reason why we use the coconut is not because of the sugar. I mean, it may be one of the big benefits, but it's because we've researched the coconut and its human health impact and all the enzymes that are in this big seed or droop and the liquid that's in there has not yet formed the coconut. It's like the elixir of life. And it happens to be full of sugars because biology, sugars, they need, I mean, sugars like the energy of the sun. When you look at the plant, and it's producing what we call root exudates, and it's feeding the soil. It's basically feeding liquid carbon, which is a sugar, to the soil. And it's incredible. But when we just start dumping sugars in, we may be stimulating biological responses that the plant wasn't looking for when it's supposed to be in control of its sugar production to the soil. And so I typically see people using sugars more in a compost tea. And the goal of the compost tea originally, so you all know, was that we were not making a nutrient tea at all. We were trying to take microorganisms, shake them off of the compost by bubbling them, have enough air in there to stimulate them to be alive and happy and give them a food source that they could devour. In doing so, you'd multiply billions of them. And if you did the timing just right, you've got the most diversity before all of those strong ones ate the weak ones and you'd pour that on your soil. But the goal with the sugar being used in the compost tea was to fully finish the sugar before you applied it to the soil, meaning the microorganisms devoured it, not the soil. And so sticking to that, a lot of us weren't like looking to just go dump molasses on the soil. It was more just a compost tea thing. Um, and molasses has been used for a long time. It's got other trace minerals in it. It's got some other benefits. Um, and the other thing that, that came out was a lot of the compost tea brewers from the Elaine Ingham crowd would say, you can't add molasses. It's gonna feed the wrong microorganisms and then you're gonna hurt your plant. I've never seen that happen, but I definitely agree and understand that certain food inputs might stimulate certain populations of microbes versus others. But in my mind, plants produce sugars, and so I don't think they can be bad and just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, personally, I use a little coconut water. I would not be scared to add a molasses occasionally, but I would avoid adding sugars all the time. And I certainly wouldn't buy a sugar that says pineapple or banana or like some flavor that it's going to impart. I don't think that's a benefit. Um, and then when you look at molasses, like at the grocery store, oftentimes it's the cheapest molasses because you can feed it to animals, they get beet molasses, they water it down so it's easy to pour, and they make a good margin. If you go to the grocery store and buy organic molasses, it's fairly expensive in the little bottle. So we carry a bulk supply of organic sugarcane molasses that's you know better quality, but um, I don't think it's necessary. I think the plants are gonna produce its own sugars. If you're growing cover crop, they're gonna be putting sugars out. Um, and using them in a compost tea, great. If you'd like to experiment with it, I think one of the reasons why the coconut water works as a finisher is because it's high potassium, not just that it's high sugar. And historically, when it comes to like nutrient growing, not living soil, you'd start heavy in phosphorus and finish strong in potassium. And that's the methodology. Even in KNF, they kind of discuss some of these things. So maybe that's part of the benefit that we're seeing, right? Um, I, I hope that answers your question. Did you, you have like a specific it does. point like the compost tea or? No, I just wanted to get kind of your overall thoughts on, I've been used, I used to use molasses all the time and uh, I find myself using it less and less, you know, really I've been just using the build soil craft blend, been using that one cup per plant 
uh, every 30 days and it's been getting me through the grow. So That's I'm becoming really more and more hands off as the years have, have gone on. And molasses is one of those things that I've just have stopped doing. Yeah. And you don't need to replace it with another cost. And um, craft blend, it's funny because I'm the same way. I never thought I'd, I, I like the individual ingredients, but you don't have 20 big 50 pound bags of your house and scooping out of all of them. So the craft blend, I'm the same way. I take it home. I use it for most things. Um, but the coconut water is probably my still last sugar that I, that I use. But when I think of it, I don't think of sugar. I just think of freeze-dried liquid enzymatic coconut, you know, but I can't put enzymes on the label and me trying to test how long the enzymes are alive and all this stuff. Um, I mean, early on there was a forum, the Living Organic Soil Forum, and that was through Gascanistan that we started after ICMAG closed. And um, one of the arguments in there was, how can you guarantee enzymes in the coconut? It dies immediately. And we found white papers that would show that it survived, but these white papers would keep it frozen the whole time. So I don't want people to think they're guaranteed enzymes, but the most direct replacement for a sprouted seed tea, which we discussed, would be coconut water. It's the seed. It's the inside, the liquid that we're all after. Even human, I mean, human health, there's a million articles on drinking coconut water for human health. And so it's basically a human sprouted seed tea. Like, and so you can use that as well. Um, the problem is, is people would go buy like harmless harvest the best, freshest coconut water. And you're spending like $8 to like spray your plants. I mean, so the freeze dried makes a lot more sense. So, or if you live where there's coconuts, right? That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to try out the coconut water. I haven't tried that yet. Uh, and if anybody's wondering more about the craft blend, we actually talked about that in length in the last episode. So the previous episode we did together will definitely be linked down in the YouTube description section below as well. A couple more things I want to get into before I let you go here. One of them I want to get into is worms. So worms is something I've added into my garden. I had the red wigglers and European night crawlers. Uh, I know a lot of people use the African night crawlers as well. But uh, talk to us about incorporating worms into the garden. This goes back with our whole theme, right? There's mulch. We talked about seed teas because of enzymes and that natural process. Worms don't just walk up to food and start eating it. What they do is they rub up next to it. They have a mucous membrane that exudes these enzymes that are in response to the material that it's next to. So if you make a worm bin, you fill it full of maybe phosphorus rich material, you'll be getting more phosphatase enzyme to break that down. Once the enzyme does its job, the worm can then absorb through its gut that material that's all bacteria broken down and sludge now. And then it can improve and utilize it for its own life. And what comes out is actually usually better than what started. And so the worms have unbelievable benefits. Now, I will put the caveat that they are an invader of the United States. Um, our forests were built by fungi and the worms came, I believe, down from Canada. I could be getting this all wrong. Uh, but when they're now in the forest layer, they eat that mulch too quickly. And that's no good for the trees because they're relying on it for banks of years of nutrition and the worms can just devour it. So it's great for us that are growing fast growing annual plants because we want that nutrition on tap. And the worms are phenomenal. In our vegetable greenhouse, when my wife just produces these rows of tall tomatoes, all that's under there is some craft blend and some nutrients and the worms, they go pull it down and they bring it into the soil and make it available to the plants. It's like this engine that produces this constant nutrient supply. And it's faster than just waiting for it to decompose. So worms are great. Um, we used to recommend the worms, the red ones and the night crawlers. I tend to lately just prefer the red wigglers. Night crawlers are fine. Our, our, our thought process was the red wigglers stay up top. The night crawlers go everywhere. But now I kind of like just, I just like them in the top. I don't turn it all into a worm bin. The red wigglers stay more where the food is. And it seems to work really, really well. Um, but I'd imagine all of them are fine. Um, if you go dig around your property in clay soil, you'll find earthworms that aren't a composting type of worm. And those may not be a, of the same benefit because they're more for compaction and things. They're not really going to break down material as fast. Um, but I think the thing to take away is that they're part of that enzymatic puzzle. They create enzymes. They help break down that organic matter that lives in the mulch layer. And that turns into plant food. The last question we get is how many, right? That's the next question. How many do I have? My, my recommendation is that we want to put less than you need. Let the worms multiply to homeostasis where they're happy in that size soil container you have. But if you do the reverse and you say, well, five are good or a hundred are good. I'll put a whole pound I just bought online in my one container. And partially because you're like, what do I do with the rest of the worms if I don't use the whole pound? Well, start a worm bin and then you have a perpetual source. But if you put a pound of worms, which is the thousand red wigglers on average, into a small container of soil, 
you're going to turn that into worm casting so fast. The worms are going to overpopulate, start ditching and climbing out, dying. And so I'd rather not start with too many and have them die into what's balanced. I'd rather start with even two, 10, 20, 50, a handful, and let them multiply to what's perfect for your soil. So that's my thought. Yeah, I, I actually started a worm bin year, year and a half ago now. And I haven't looked back, you know, I free worms. They said, well, I made that one investment, right, to get the worms to begin. But now I can just grab them wherever, whenever. Yeah, you have a buddy come over, you're like, hey, some worms. <laughs> <laughs> grab them from the worm bin and put them into my pots whenever I want. So, yeah, definitely worth it in my opinion. Okay, so towards the end of the grow, you believe in a fade or senescence at the end of the grow cycle, right? Now, do you believe in leaching or flushing when growing organically? And let me define those two real quick because there's so many definitions out there. Leaching defined as not feeding any organic inputs for the final few weeks of the plant's life and flushing as defined as running a large amount of water through the medium in order to reduce the nutrition to starve the plant. Should growers leach or flush their soil at the end of the growth cycle? No, I would actually switch those two. But what you're saying is <laughs> right, meaning when most people say flush, they're like in hydro, they switch to no nutrients. Yeah. That's so just, many definitions. <laughs> right? But leaching traditionally means you're leaching out. You're, you're gra- everything has to come out. On a farm, you leach, you don't flush. But as long as we're clear on what we're talking about, I agree with neither. And what I mean by this is that we worked really hard to build this soil up. And one of the benefits of living soil is that you see the genetic potential. And the genetic potential, what I mean by that is it's going to determine on its own when the end of its life is. And it's going to start to senesce regardless whether there's fertility in the soil or not. Part of what may help this is some colder temperatures, slowing the biology down and the release of nutrients. Some people use cold water to do that. And that also stimulates some of the colors and some of the mimicry of colder season coming into winter and to the harvest. Um, but getting that runoff, it's not going to change anything. Um, it, I think that the thought is that you run it off so hard that your soil is now devoid of nutrient and now the plant must starve. But this is like saying someone who's 90 on their deathbed is going to eat all your Thanksgiving dinner. They don't even, like, it's not even a thought. The plant is dying on its own. It's going to stop taking food up, okay? I think you could probably stop watering the last week or two in a big bed of soil. It has plenty of water and you, it just doesn't need as much now that it's ripening. It's done growing basically at that point. And you'll notice because in hydro, if you picked a genetic and grew it, and maybe you weren't familiar with exactly when it should be harvested, at a certain point, you're going to say, oh, the schedule says switch to flush. Well, guess what? It's going to senescence. It's going to start to fade because it has no choice. <laughs> but when you're in living soil, I like to give it that choice. And it may not start to fade on week seven or eight. It may fade on week 10, but it does it. And it does it because it's done. And at that point, you know you've maxed out your genetic potential. You've gotten all of the different terpenes and flavors and everything that you want peaked out and you're, you're, you're finished. And so I do like to see the fade. I will see, I see, say I see difference in some genetics. Uh, Quadrant 2 in our YouTube series right now, I just took a video. Um, one's dark purple and leathery looking and the other one's faded ye- lime yellow and green. And so they both senesced in their own ways. Um, but flushing would maybe take that purple and tone it down just a bit like running water through or just plain, but I don't think that's a benefit in living soil. And that returns me back to saying like, look at what's in the plant is already in the plant. Pouring water on the media is not going to change that. What it can do is if there's nothing in the soil at all and you've prematurely taken everything out of the soil because you leached and flushed and all those things, well now the plant is gonna mobilize nutrients from its leaf, anything mobile, into the bud. It's gonna use that as food, but guess what? It's still eating. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just eating its own leaves. Um, so I, I still feel like it's kind of a, a, a mute point, but um, I do say harvesting a dark green plant early because it wasn't finished, it's not as good as a finished product. I'm not saying that it's because it was faded, but finishing that plant properly, whether it was a light fade or whether it stayed somewhat perky green, as long as it showed you that it was finished, I get great, great results out of the end material. Um, and you know, uh, there's other tricks too, like tomatoes. If you know it's getting really cold, you can actually just go cut the top off of it, and it'll force it to finish fruiting faster, so that you get tomatoes before they freeze. Um, all plants kind of have a reaction to trying to produce and stay alive, and to finish their job. And to come in there and start to just dump water or pretend like you have to flush, I don't think that there's any reason to do so. so. Well said. 
Well, Jeremy, we have covered a ton of different topics in such a short period of time, and I have a list of other topics that we could get into. So if you guys want to see a part three, maybe we can drag him back for a part three sometime this year, maybe. Let us know down in the comments section below. Also, list some questions you have for Jeremy. Maybe I can go over those in the next episode as well. Jeremy, tell the viewers how they can find you, and is there anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Um, nothing right now. Our soil is the best it's ever been. It works phenomenally well. We've gotten uh, more quality control in the back end, lots more testing, and I'm just happy that we get to keep investing into this process because it's making a better and better product for our customer, and I get to experience the benefits of that as well. The way to find me is at buildasoil.com. Uh, we've got a really great team of support. You can email support at buildasoil. You can live chat, go to our Instagram. The main goal is that we want to provide um, the best quality ingredients to empower you and your grow. And that has to come with the education so that you use them properly. And so you can check out our YouTube channel as well, which I know you've mentioned. Um, but that's really everything. It's simple. We're just trying to have fun, grow plants. And as you turn this into a hobby and you start to turn it into a passion, it turns into a lot of questions and a lot of wonderment and a lot of research. And so um, these episodes, like when you get to ask me questions, they're so much better than just some FAQ where I read it aloud. There's some interaction and I think you you picked a lot of topics that were really good, like in order. So I think this is going to be a good episode. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. I'll definitely have a link to Jeremy's YouTube channel down in the YouTube description section below. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode. And I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Jeremy, thanks once again. Much appreciated. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you. See you guys. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.